All right, how's everybody doing? Yeah, worship was just, woo! I hear you, I hear you. Hey, uh, if you have your Bible, let's open it up to uh, Matthew chapter 21. And uh, if you don't have one, there should be a Bible somewhere close by, and it's going to be page 465 uh, and 466 today. So uh, feel free to grab that and pull that out uh, and get to Matthew chapter 21. We are uh, celebrating Palm Sunday and I don't, I don't know about you. I, I, I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. Um, I grew up going to church, um, and uh, but we, my, the, the church that I grew up in, we never celebrated Palm Sunday. Uh, we just kind of, or, or I was at a baseball tournament. I don't know. Like one of those things was was happening. But I don't remember ever like making it a big deal and getting out the palm branches as a kid and like waving them or doing the thing that you do uh, on Palm Sunday a lot of times. And so it just wasn't something that I grew up with. And, and, uh, and I didn't really know even what Palm Sunday was until I was in my 20s. And, uh, and so like I kind of came to, to understand and realize it. Um, but it's, it's the beginning of Holy Week. Um, and it's the beginning of Jesus' last week um, on earth. And, and so it's just kind of one of those like really fascinating things uh, that, that we celebrate as a church because it, it is, is we're celebrating Jesus's uh, kind of final like, like push toward the cross and toward Easter Sunday, which we'll celebrate next week and, and on Good Friday at our worship night. But we get to, we get to kick it off with, with Palm Sunday and the story of, of Jesus riding into town on Palm Sunday and where this this Sunday gets its name and and why it's so important. So um, so we're going to dive into this today. We're going to read through this story at the beginning of uh, Matthew 21, and uh, we're going to kind of take it a, a couple chunks at a time and uh, and then try and make some application uh, as we go. But and I'll, and I'll try and give a little bit of context as we go as well. But uh, it says this Matthew 21 verse one, as they approached Jerusalem. And came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Unite them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Um, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So here's kind of the thing. Jesus has started to generate a little bit of a buzz at this point. I mean, he's he's been in ministry now for three years. He's generating a buzz. He's teaching with authority and he's also healing people. Now, this is really a fascinating thing, because just before he heads into uh, Jerusalem uh, for Holy Week, he heals one of his really good friends and actually doesn't just heal him. He raises him from the dead, Lazarus. Um, and, and so there is just a ton of people who saw Lazarus dead for three days. Jesus raises him from the dead. And now, like, you think that it was crazy before trying to hang out with Jesus. Now it's, like, insane. And things are just really, really nuts. And John tells us that there was just this group of people, this crowd of people, that were just all around Jesus and worshiping him and following him and trusting him and all of these other kinds of things just because of that one thing. He did with Lazarus, but he's been doing so many other things. He's been casting out demons. He's been just gaining a following. Now, strangely enough, um, the the prophet Zechariah tells us that the king of the Jews is going to ride in when he's coming to to rule and reign. He's going to ride in on a donkey. Now, this is an interesting thing because um, because. Most kings don't ride in on donkeys. They ride in on war horses. And so Zechariah was trying to point us to the fact that this king, the king of the Jews, is going to be different. He's going to be a different kind of king. He's going to be, he's going to be gentle and lowly and humble in heart. And so it's just, a, it's just this really, really kind of interesting thing that, that's happening here. But the Jews have been waiting for this king. I mean, they have been waiting for a long time, for generations. They've been telling their children about this king who's coming. The promises that have been given to them. 
and that they would be given this ruler that would set them free from the worst of all periods of Israel's uh, life. And, and honestly, up to this point, Israel hasn't really had a whole lot of good going on. Right. They knew what the promise was, but they were living under this oppression for most of their existence. And and they just didn't realize the means of which this promise was going to come. Because they really believed that a political power, a political king was going to come overthrow Caesar, overthrow Rome and build Israel into this powerful, powerful people in the world. And as everyone has their gaze set on this king and waiting for this king to come. To rule and reign on a throne, Jesus is going to, he has his eyes set. His gaze is set toward the cross. It says something very interesting as you read through this story of Jesus throughout the Gospels. It says something very interesting. It says over and over and over again, it says, and they were on their way to Jerusalem. Or they, now they headed toward Jerusalem. And you'll read this a few chapters ahead or a chapter ahead as you kind of go through these stories in the Gospels. And basically it's saying like Jesus is determined. He knows where he's going. He's going to the cross. And that's going to take place in Jerusalem. He's headed there and he knows he's headed there. And he's not going to let anything stop him from getting there. He has encounters along the way, but his eyes are set toward the cross. And we see at the very beginning of this passage, he says, as they approach Jerusalem. And that's just a little hint that this is where Jesus focuses. His focus is to go to the cross. That's what, his, as he rides in, his focus is on the cross. Everyone else's focus is on this king who's going to come in and rule and reign. And so his focus is different than the people's focus. And that leads the people to this place in verse 6. It says, the disciples went ahead and did what Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead um, of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so this is, man, Jesus comes in on the donkey. And when he gets on that donkey, it starts mass hysteria. I mean, you think about every celebrity that you've ever seen that has any large fall. I mean, it is just their people are going crazy because they know what Zacharias said. And now they see it happening before their very eyes. It's what they've been waiting for. They go nuts. They start jumping and shouting and dancing and laying out palm branches and cloaks on the ground. He's the one, guys. He's the one. He's the one we've been waiting for for generations. The one we've been talking about. He's going to set us free. And he is. He's going to set them free. The only problem is, is that most of these people don't care a whole lot about being set free from their sin. They're more concerned about being set free from their circumstance. And they're not, not worried about their life of sin. They're not worried about their life of depravity. They're worried about their enemies. And Jesus comes in and he says, I'm not really as concerned about your enemies as you are. I'm more concerned about the enemy. And the fact that he has taken hold of your hearts and drawn you into sin. And so Jesus goes into Jerusalem for the next four days. He rides in and he just goes at it with the chief priests and the teachers of the law. His very next scene, he shows up at the temple and he turns the tables over and, uh, and, and it, it all begins. He, he, uses hard, he uses hard language to understand about the cost of of what it means to follow him and what it would mean for you to for, to see his kingdom come. And, and, the, and the price that has to be paid just seems too great. Everything Jesus says and everything Jesus does seems really outlandish and really crazy to most of the people who are on looking. And it, honestly, it changes these people's minds. Their minds are changed about who Jesus is because he is not, he, he's not going to be their king. <laughs> because they they. They quickly see Jesus is not the king that they want him to be. See, the problem 
the problem is that they 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 saw they saw a mess in the world that they wanted fixed and they thought this king was going to fix it but they didn't see the mess within themselves that Jesus ultimately wants to fix and deal with See, Jesus has always been about coming and offering people freedom from sin and from death, not difficult circumstances. The circumstances actually are often opportunities to be faithful. The struggle, the pain, the difficult are opportunities to be faithful and still worship and give God praise because he is still good even when life isn't. But most people at least in this crowd, wanted Jesus to save them from their circumstance and not their sin. And so, Jesus came to do something they did not want Jesus to do. Paul says in 1 Timothy, he says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I don't know of a better way to sum up the gospel and what the gospel is about. That Jesus came in the world to save sinners. These people, they don't want to be saved from sin. They don't, want, they don't want that. They want Jesus to save them from their circumstance. And when he's not going to save them from their circumstance, their tune changes very quickly. Look at John chapter 19. Flip over there, or you can follow along. These, actually, uh, th- these verses will be on the screen if you want to follow along there. But John chapter 19, verse 13 through 16 says this. It says, when Pilate heard this, he, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge seat at the place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic mean is, is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. And here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate answered him, or finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Man. Five days later. Just five days. Less than, less than a whole week later. The people going from Hosanna, son of David. Which just means, Savior, save us. To crucify him. Get him out of here. Because he isn't the king that they want him to be. From a road littered with cheers and celebration. To a road littered with mockers. And hatred. And anger. And rage. To a group of people who believe, of believers, strong and confident. To a group of blasphemers. From riding in triumphantly to carrying a cross to his death. As we look from the outside in, we can easily begin to go, how can they not see it? What's wrong with these people? But we kind of miss it too, don't we? If we're honest. We miss it. We miss it because we make it about ourselves. We make it about our circumstances. We make it about our situation. We make it about how good we are, how good we aren't. Maybe it's because we have too much pride and we think of ourselves too highly. So we don't need a savior like Jesus. Because we're pretty good people. Or maybe we don't think highly enough of ourselves in the light of God's glory and grace. And we think that he couldn't love someone like us. We're too broken. We're too much of a sinner. He didn't come to save me. He maybe came to save some sinners, but not all sinners because I'm the worst. No. He came to save all of us. Especially the worst. Maybe it's because of what it will cost us ultimately to let him 
take over our life, to be truly forgiven and actually begin to follow him, what will that cost us? How will our life change? And do we do we submit to his authority and his willingness to do that in our lives if we give him that authority? See, whatever whatever it is, there there are people, the people who yelled crucify him, they were they were unwilling to let Jesus rule and reign in their life. In the way in which he can, and the way in which he came to, and the way in which he wants to, and to be honest, we're not much different. Because if we're honest, he's often the king that, that we don't want. A lot of us, if we're honest, we like our sin. Some of us even love it. I have a friend, we were talking about our relationship with God and how... Like we we're not necessarily who we once were, and uh, and it was really interesting because he was talking to me. He goes, you know, when I was in high school, I didn't like to smoke weed. I loved to smoke weed. <laughs> and you may not think that's funny. I think that's hilarious because he's at least being honest about where he was. That like he loved it, and most of us just aren't that honest. Because some, some, some of the men in the room today, like, you don't just like looking at porn. You love it. And some of you in the room, you don't just like to spend money on things that you don't need, but you love it, even if it means you rack up piles and piles of debt. And some of you don't just like social media. You love it because it gives you an opportunity to judge other people and gossip. We don't just like it. We love it. And if we're honest. If push came to shove. Some of us would rather die than live without our sin. We would much easily rather live without Jesus. If we could hold on to our sin. And we wouldn't say that. Like no one would verbalize that. Right? No one in the room is going to be like. Yep. I want my sin more than I want Jesus. But it's where our hearts are. Sometimes. In some cases. And it, it reaches far. It goes deep. It impacts things that are so, so deep within us. It impacts our relationships and our interactions with other people in ways that we don't even realize or know. It ruins families. But we would rather have that than have Jesus. But here's the good news. The good news of the gospel is whether you know how far it reaches or how deep it is, if you can come to grips with the fact that you are a sinner, you have a hope. The Bible says that, yes, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That if we come to know Jesus, if we let him be the king that he is, maybe not the king we want, but the king that he is, that he can take away our sin. That he can save us from our sin. That he can, he can release us from a life of sin and death. We need him. We have no hope without him. And if we accept that, the Bible says that our sin can be removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Now think about this for just a second. How far away is the east from the west? It's forever far. You start heading east right now and you keep going east and you never turn around. You are always going east. You will never go west. If you go west right now and you head west and you never turn around, you will always be going west. They are polar opposites. And Jesus says, we and our sin can be separated as far as the east is from the west. That he can drive out our sin and remove it from our life if we give our life to him. And as we begin to give our life to him, then he begins to work on our hearts in a way that makes sin a lot less lovable and a lot less likable. And we begin to have a heart towards sin like Jesus has a heart towards sin. And we begin to move away from it. But we don't need saving from our circumstance. 
We need saving from our sin. And we can't miss that. If we miss that, we miss everything. We miss the whole point of the king that Jesus is. And so I just pray we're not as hard-hearted as these Jewish people who wanted Jesus to be something that he wasn't. And we can accept him for who he really is. Even if we don't necessarily like that all the time. Let me, let me illustrate what I mean by, by this. When I say like we need Jesus to save us from not our circumstance but from our sin. Let, let me just try and illustrate what that looks like in our world a lot of times. Some of us would rather uh, God help us find a new job or get a job more than we would want Jesus to deal with our sin. Like deep in our heart, we want God to deal with that problem and that situation more than we do our sin. When we go and we pray, we are not praying, God, do something about my sin. We're praying, God, do something about my circumstance. Many of us, when we, we want um, someone to be healed, we know someone really close to us, a family member or a loved one, and we want them to be healed. We want them to be free of whatever is going on in their life, whatever it is that's drawing, uh, like, like just, just their, their body to ache and be in pain. We're praying for people to be released from cancer and be healed forever because that death sentence is coming if nothing happens. And many of us want that more than we want Jesus to deal with our sin. We would, maybe some of us would rather Jesus fix our country, fix the problems in our country, fix the policy in our country, fix the leaders in our country more than we want him to deal with our sin. Some of us would rather him fix our financial situation or our living situation more than we want him to deal with our sin. See, the truth is, many of us in the room, we see all the things that are messed up, and it's all messed up. We live in a world where, in sheer evil, somebody walked into another school on another week, on another day, and killed innocent children Teachers and administrators. So broken. So evil. But you know how Jesus is going to do away with that evil? Saving us from our sin. You know how he's going to deal with circumstances like that? He's going to save us transform us from the inside out as we follow him and he's going to turn us into people who look like him and he's going to bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven through that process but it begins by being willing to say god i'm a sinner and i want you to deal with my sin first and foremost above all else And then as we follow him and as we trust him, some of those other things maybe get a little bit brighter in our life. Or at least maybe we don't get so bogged down by them because we know where our hope truly lies. And the truth is, it's like, man, there's plenty of pain, there's plenty of struggle, there's plenty of strife. But but also the good news of of being forgiven of our sin and, and having eternity in our grasp through Jesus is that... When he saves us from our sins, we have hope that one day the struggle, the pain, the loss will realize they're just temperate situations, circumstances here as a part of this broken world. But in the light of salvation, the light of eternity, when there's no more death and there's no more pain, there's no more loss and there's no more struggle and Jesus is wiping every tear from our eye, we will know. And we will praise God because he saved us from our sin. And so even if life is good right now here on earth, I'm telling you right now, it will end badly if you don't know Jesus. And if you don't let him save you from your sin. And I also just want to say, no matter how bad life is right now, because it might be bad. It might be really hard to wake up every day. And keep trying. And keep going. 
But no matter how bad it is, if you have Jesus, you have it all. You have everything you need. He's enough. And if you don't believe that, then you know where you are. If that isn't true for you, then you know where you sit and you know where you stand before God. I don't have to tell you. He's either enough or he's not. But he's, he, he's everything we need. He might not always be the king we want, but he is the king we need. And so this week, church, I, what, I, what I want to do as we kick off Holy Week, I just, I just want us to see that truth. I want us to live in that truth. I want us to celebrate and worship God in that truth this week. That He has saved us. That He's offered us redemption in place of our sin. Like we didn't do anything to earn it. We've done nothing but turn our back and live lives recklessly and abandon toward Him and His will. And yet he says, I love you. I'm going to go to the cross for you. I'm going to raise from the grave for you. I'm going to save you from your sin. And hopefully that's enough for us. Amen? And as we go to the table today, as we take communion, that, that's, that's what I want you to do is you just take the bread, take the cup back to your seat and sit for a moment just... Just dwell in that hope. The hope that, man, my sin is as far from me as the east as the west because of this body and this blood. Because of his victorious resurrection. And so no matter what I'm going through right now, I have Jesus and that's enough. May that be where we sit as we go to the table this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for just the chance we have to be here and to worship you and give you glory and honor and praise. God, you are worthy. You are so worthy. More worthy than we can um, express in words or in feelings or in songs or in anything else. God, we're just so grateful. So grateful that you love us, that you save us. Not from every situation, not from every circumstance, not from every um, diagnosis. Or struggle. But God that you save us from what's most. Most pressing. And the biggest problem we have. And that's our sin. And that because you save us. From our sin we have hope. No matter given. No, no matter what our circumstances. Circumstances. We have hope. Now, whether in this life or in eternity, there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more mourning, and you will wipe every tear from our eye. God, we love you and praise you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.